committee will uh, come to order. I want to thank our witnesses for being here. We will get to you in just a, just a minute. We are going to start with uh, opening statements and begin by recognizing the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this very important hearing today. Our witnesses are here because it is important the American people understand that with a, a pattern and a history of, and I use the word corruption in parentheses, but inappropriate behavior, questionable loans, a number of, uh, of scandals that have uh, made the American people question whether or not the term bank is appropriate for the Export-Import Bank. XM Bank is not just a government program or a subsidy. Is it, it is, in fact, a longstanding entity that is intended to help us compete in our exports around the world. It is intended to make American products that would not otherwise be produced and exported possible. But it is, in fact, a program that comes with a, a cost any time the American people have a question about whether or not the risk is worth the reward. I'm, Mr. Chairman, I am one member who believes that the, the risk and reward should be positive. Americans compete around the world with countries who play by different rules. There are countries like China that will simply buy their way into a market. They will bribe individuals in government to gain rights and capabilities. Even countries as advanced as France are known to fail to meet the anti-corruption laws that America observes. So for that reason, it is important when Airbus has an opportunity to sell to America that Boeing have an opportunity to have an even playing field. No company should be forced to move out of the country in order to access plans and financing that would be available to them, would not be available to them if they were within this. Having said that, our jurisdiction is not on renewing the XM Bank. Our jurisdiction clearly is on waste, fraud, and abuse, and the reorganization or organizational strategies necessary for the American people to have a feeling of confidence in the Export-Import Bank. That does mean that we have to look at failures related to corruption and failures related to does this entity make loans possible where they otherwise wouldn't be possible, or the, is it often used for very high numbers for entities that would, in fact, otherwise still have a sale? This committee only a few weeks ago looked at an embassy program that went awry in Papua New Guinea. We do not blame the XM Bank for the failure of that construction project. But a deciding factor in the mid-construction change was, in fact, a XM Bank-sponsored loan program that was going to cause natural gas to be liquefied in Papua New Guinea and then sent to China. I, for one member, have serious questions about whether or not a company that is American-flagged but ultimately global can receive income from one country, sell it to another country, and then claim that the risk should be on the American taxpayers. So as we look at both the loan portfolio, the loan criteria, and the integrity of the organization, I hope we will do so with a positive attitude that this is a longstanding program that has merit, but that, in fact, we have an obligation to see lives up to the highest standards, not of a bank, not of a government entity, but of a program designed on behalf of the American people to promote positive job growth here in America through our products being competitive around the world. And for that reason, Mr. Chairman, you are showing great leadership here today in giving the bank and others an opportunity to make their case for how they can do better on behalf of the American people. And I thank you for that and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the Chairman. I uh, would now yield to the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome our uh, witnesses on today's panel. Today's hearing is intended to examine recent allegations of corruption 
at the Export-Import Bank, an independent, self-sustaining agency with a history of supporting U.S. jobs by financing the export of American goods and services. I do look forward to today's testimony on the Bank's anti-corruption and anti-fraud efforts, uh, the Bank's process for res responding to employee integrity issues, and how it does maintain high ethical standards that Congress and the American public expect from all government agencies. However, I am concerned that this hearing today has been called in a rush to judgment intended to tarnish the reputation of the bank and its employees in an attempt unduly to influence a vote on the bank's reauthorization. Four Ex-Im Bank employees are currently under investigation. Details of those investigations cannot and should not be discussed at this hearing because congressional oversight is not supposed to jeopardize ongoing personnel actions or criminal investigations. I hope that the Chairman will agree to instruct members not to jeopardize unintentionally the investigations by pressing for certain details of alleged misconduct. Nonetheless, both Chairman Jordan and Chairman Issa have stated that these incidents, which we have very limited detail about, suggest a broader culture of corruption at the bank, but the facts do not support that conclusion. Each of these investigations followed a formal referral for investigation that originated in the XM Bank's General Counsel's Office. And to date, every case of alleged fraud that the IG has referred for prosecution concerns outside entities which were seeking to steal taxpayer funds, not bank employees. Now, the fact that outside parties attempted to defraud the bank does not indicate that there is a, cul a culture of corruption inside the bank. Calling the bank corrupt for crimes committed against it is what we call blaming the victim. Now, let's talk about what this hearing is really about and that is the reauthorization of the XM Bank. This issue, for the first time in modern memory, has become controversial, uh, not because of the issue before us today, but because the Tea Party faction of the Republican Party is holding this reauthorization hostage. This hearing seems to be designed to influence this important upcoming vote with propaganda and political theater. A large group of Democrats as well as sensible, moderate Republicans, many of whom I am proud to call my friends, understand the contribution that the Export-Import Bank makes to our communities by providing support for jobs and investments in small businesses all across America. It helps our domestic manufacturers compete with companies that are getting help from their own country's export banks overseas. We have to level the playing field for our companies because other countries are putting their thumbs on the scale in favor of their own manufacturers. If we don't level the playing field for our companies, our companies and our workers face unfair disadvantage. The banks support businesses in every state in the union. In my district alone, I am very happy that the bank supports 10 companies and 639 jobs. In fact, in Pennsylvania, the bank supports $5.5 billion in exports. Nationwide, the bank has supported 1.2 million American jobs, generated billions for the government, and cost the U.S. taxpayers nothing. In fact, we make money on the deals. On average, 87 percent of bank transactions benefit small business exporters of U.S. made goods and services. These are deals that could not and would not be done by the private sector alone and are the perfect example of the kinds of public-private partnerships we need to get our economy going again, get our businesses thriving again, and get our people back to work. And speaking of getting back to work, I would note that this is the first hearing in the Economic Growth, Job Creation and Regulatory Affairs subcommittee that has even tangentially, tangentially anything to do with job creation, and therefore I appreciate the Chairman having this hearing at all. I do hope the Chairman will join with me and other Republican and Democratic members who are calling for a reauthorization of a bank 
that supports U.S. jobs by financing the export of American goods and services. In fact, an op-ed by William E. Brock, Labor Secretary under President Ronald Reagan, shows how far away from the tenets of President Reagan the modern Republican Party has drifted. He said, as a Republican, I would prefer that the private sector carry the entire load of supporting our international competitiveness but the world market is not a level playing field, and the bank is absolutely vital for companies involved in the global economy. Having worked closely with Mr. Reagan on trade issues, I am confident that he felt the same. And, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter this op-ed by former Secretary Brock into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his statement. According to a recent report, well, let me do one other thing first. Let, I ask unanimous consent that Mr. Mulvaney, the gentleman from South Carolina, be allowed to participate in today's hearing. Without objection, uh, so ordered. According to a recent report in the Wall Street Journal, at least four bank employees are under investigation for accepting bribes and steering Federal contracts to favored companies. In fact, fraud within and against the bank may be far more widespread. The Acting Inspector General of the Bank has informed the Committee that there are at least 40 40 active and ongoing investigations of fraud. And I would just, as, as an aside, highlight after the ranking member's opening statement that what better time, what better time to discuss real concerns at the Export Import Bank than when we are looking at the issue of reauthorization? I think this would be the appropriate time to have this kind of hearing and look at these very issues. In a hearing last month before the Financial Services Committee, Mr. Hochberg testified, quote, the article that was in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, in my opinion, is actually a good article because it says to our staff and to the exporter, if you are doing anything funny, any funny business, we are on to you. But just a few years ago, the Export-Import Bank was at the center of the most high-profile corruption scandal, ABSCAM, when former Congressman William Jefferson was caught with $90,000 in his freezer. As part of that investigation, an XM Bank employee admitted to taking a $100,000 bribe from a Nigerian businessman seeking financing from the bank. Apparently, the bank's employees need regular reminders that it is wrong to accept bribes. The allegations are appalling, but they are hardly shocking. The sole purpose of the XM Bank is to hand out billions of dollars to private companies in the form of direct loans, loan guarantees, and credit insurance. Given such massive government largesse, the bank is a natural target for fraud, and its employees are natural targets for bribery and corruption. What is shocking? is how the bank has managed that risk. One of the witnesses before the committee today is alleged to have accepted bribes from a South Florida exporter known as Impex Associates. XM Bank has a long history with Impex Associates, approving over 22 deals stretching from 2002 to 2011. In 2006, a 70-page lawsuit filed in Federal court laid out in excruciating detail how Impex Associates was nothing more than a massive scheme to defraud the bank. Even after the whole world knew that Impex Associates was bilking the American taxpayer, it took the bank's management three years, three years to suspect there was anything wrong and refer the matter to the Inspector General. In fact, during those three years, the bank approved five more deals with Impex, subjecting taxpayers to up to $40 million in liability. According to the 2013 Federal Employee Survey, the bank's staff have little faith in its leadership. When asked if, quote, my organization's leaders maintain high standards of honesty and integrity, only 42 percent of the employees at the bank said yes. When asked whether they could, quote, disclose a suspected violation of any law, rule, or regulation without fear of reprisal, only 50 percent of the bank employees said yes. That is the culture that exists at the bank. That is why it is appropriate we have this hearing at a time when we are looking at the issue of reauthorization. President Obama famously said that when the American people lose faith in the ethical standards of government employees, all is lost. In the private sector, if half of the employees of a company lost faith in their leadership, there would be big problems with that company. Unfortunately, that is what appears to be the case today with the Export-Import Bank. That is why we are having this hearing. And with that, I would yield back our time and recognize. Is there anyone else on the Democrat side who is Mr. Cummings? Anyone else wish to make an opening statement? Anyone else on the Republican side wish to make an opening statement? Um, we will now go to our members who have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now go to our witnesses. We have first Mr. Johnny Gutierrez, who is the former official uh, in the short term trade and finance division, trade finance division, excuse me, of the Export Import Bank. We have the Honorable Fred Huckberg, 
who is Chairman and President of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and uh, Ms. Diane Katz, who is a Research Fellow in the Regulatory Policy Division at the Heritage Foundation. We want to thank you all for being here. We know it is uh, not always easy to do this, but we appreciate um, you being here with us. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If you will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that each witness answered in the affirmative. Um, you guys know how this works. Given five minutes, more or less, right around the five-minute mark, uh, to make your opening statement. I know some of you have submitted those already in, in written form. Uh, I would like to thank you all for being here. And we will start first with Mr. Gutierrez. Mr. Gutierrez, you have not provided us with any written testimony for today's hearing. Do you wish to make an opening statement? Upon advice of counsel, I hereby invoke my privilege against self-incrimination under the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, which protects the innocent as well as the guilty. We, we um, certainly respect that right you have, Mr. Uh, Gutierrez, under our, our wonderful Constitution. Um, Mr. Gutierrez, as an official in the Export-Import Bank's Short-Term Trade Finance Division, you are uniquely qualified to provide testimony that will help the Committee better understand allegations of corruption and fraud at the Export-Import Bank. To that end, I must ask you to consider answering the questions. So if you will just bear with me. Mr. Gutierrez, while you were at the Export-Import Bank, did you accept any gifts or items of value from either Geraldo Diaz or Impex Associates? Upon advice of counsel, I hereby invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. I just have a couple of questions, Mr. Gutierrez, and, and then, then we will let you go here. Mr. Gutierrez, the Wall Street Journal reported that you and three other Export-Import Bank employees accepted gifts and, and kickbacks and improperly awarded contracts to favored companies. Are you aware of any other employees at the Export-Import Bank who accepted gifts or items of value from companies or individuals seeking export financing? Upon advice of counsel, I hereby invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Just one last question, Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, are you prepared to answer any questions here today about anything you did while you were at the Export-Import Bank? Upon advice of counsel, I hereby invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Does the ranking member have questions for Mr. Gutierrez? Not at this time. Mr. Gutierrez. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would ask before you dismiss the witness that uh, instruct counsel to meet with our counsel to see whether or not there is or could be a proffer uh, prior to dismissal, since Mr. Gutierrez is here pursuant to a subpoena. We would rather do that than to uh, try to make contact later. Uh, we are going to excuse Mr. Gutierrez. And if uh, Mr. Gutierrez, if there is a chance you and your counsel could visit briefly with our counsel and uh, uh, after you are dismissed, we would appreciate that. So we will just take a short recess. Mr. Gutierrez, you are you're dismissed. A uh, couple two-minute break here, and we will maybe rearrange the table a little bit, and then we will be right back for opening statements from Mr. Hochberg and Ms. Katz. Mr. Gutierrez, thank you for being here today. Witness is dismissed. Mr. Hochberg, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Cartwright and Committee members, thank you for inviting me here to testify before you today. Exim Bank is the official export credit agency of the United States. We operate exclusively in cases where the private sector is unwilling or unable to provide support and to level the playing field against foreign competition. I am proud of our 400-plus employees do each and every day. Exim Bank has supported 1.2 million private sector jobs in the U.S. US jobs since 2009, including 205,000 in fiscal 2013 alone. 
The bank operates at no cost to taxpayers. And in fiscal 2013, the bank generated $1,057 million for U.S. taxpayers above and beyond the cost of all operations and loan loss reserves. The $1 billion goes towards deficit reduction. We report our default rate to Congress every 90 days. As of June 30th, Exim's default rate was 0.194 percent, or in other words, less than one-fifth of a percent. The private sector average rate, as calculated by the Fed, is currently three to four times that amount. Today's hearing concerns ethics and how the agency addresses this important area of public trust. The bank is fully committed to transparency and expects the highest ethical standards from all employees. And I look at this in three distinct areas. One, a culture of ethics starts at the top. I, personally, and the management team at the bank are fully committed to running an ethical agency and operating at the highest ethical standards in government. Anything less than this is unacceptable. Second, a committed culture of ethics must also have strong ethical training and compliance program to ensure that all employees understand and internalize regulations and ethical expectations. And third, lastly, because we don't live in a perfect world, an effective monitoring and enforcement program must also exist. We work very closely with the Inspector General to monitor and enforce ethical concerns or breaches. One of my first orders of business when I joined Exim was to establish a regular meeting with the Inspector General. I continue to meet with him privately each and every month. Before joining Exim, I ran a business, a small business in fact, for 20 years, and I know what it means to meet a weekly payroll. I also know that the only way for an organization to be successful is to operate at a high ethical level and have zero tolerance for fraud, waste, or abuse. Additionally, let me add that the agency's ethics program are fully compliant with all laws, regulations, and policies that govern this aspect of our work. We are committed to comprehensive ethics training for all employees. In fact, we have a manual right here. Uh, and foster an environment where employees are encouraged to ask questions and report suspect, suspected unethical behavior. Here are just seven examples of what we are doing. All new employees receive the manual ethics training upon arrival. They also receive mandatory annual ethics training thereafter. Three, Exim thoroughly reviews all financial disclosure reports required to be uh, filed by all employees on an annual basis. Four, we conduct background checks on all of our employees and contractors that work at the bank. Five, we also periodically conduct background reinvestigations on employees who have access to sensitive information and those who hold high-level security clearances. Six, we provide advice to employees to avoid any potential conflicts of interest. And lastly, we work closely with and refer matters as appropriate to the Inspector General. As I mentioned, I meet monthly with the Inspector General and we review the status of audits and other ongoing investigations and periodic reports to Congress. I am only informed of an investigation at the discretion of the Inspector General. Exim Bank fully respects the authority of Congress to provide oversight of the bank, and we strive to comply with all congressional requests to the fullest extent possible without compromising ongoing investigations. I know that every member of this panel shares my concern about not interfering with an ongoing criminal investigation. The last thing I want to do is interfere with the ability of law enforcement officials to fully and successfully prosecute wrongdoing. I know there is intense interest in the allegations mentioned in a recent newspaper article. So as not to compromise the ongoing criminal investigations, privacy interest, and due process rights, I can only say the following. Three individuals are no longer employed by the bank, and a fourth has been placed on administrative leave. I want to reiterate the bank has zero tolerance for ethics violations, and I look forward to answering your questions. I now recognize Ms. Katz. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Cartwright, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for having me 
here today to testify. My name is Diane Katz, and I am a research fellow in regulatory policy at the Heritage Foundation. The views expressed in this testimony are my own and should not be construed as official positions of the Heritage Foundation. As you are aware, the charter of the Export-Import Bank expires on September 30th. Proponents of reauthorization assert that the bank sustains American jobs, fills gaps in export financing, and levels the playing field against subsidies provided by foreign governments. However, there is abundant evidence to the contrary, and the academic literature is virtually unanimous in concluding that export subsidies are detrimental. The Office of Inspector General and the Government Accountability Office have repeatedly documented mismanagement and dysfunction within XM, including insufficient policies to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. This pattern of carelessness with taxpayer dollars is evident in the multitude of criminal cases involving the bank. As the Chairman noted, employees say that ethical conduct is not among XM's strengths. In a 2013 government survey, only 42 percent of bank employees agreed with the statement, my organization's leaders maintain high standards of honesty and integrity. In a 2013 review of direct loans, the Office of Inspector General identified the bank's noncompliance with even the most basic Federal procedures, noting, quote, bank personnel fail to document applicants' eligibility and application requirements and disregard mandatory checks on applicants' character and financial integrity, end quote. Operational deficiencies appear to have worsened as bank financing has surged. XM's portfolio has increased by 94 percent since 2008. As noted by the Inspector General, this rapid growth raises concerns as to XM's inability to manage and monitor its portfolio. Failures in management and monitor are evident in dozens of cases of fraud. Based on a review of government data, the Heritage Foundation documented 124 investigations initiated between October 2007 and March 2014, as well as 792 claims involving more than a half billion dollars. There also have been 74 administrative actions since April 2009 in which bank officials have been forced to halt transactions based upon investigative findings. A lack of due diligence was explicitly cited in the disappearance of $577 million related to the bank's financing of a massive natural gas project in Papua New Guinea. The Inspector General noted that XM did not fully vet the relevant persons and entities connected with the project. Similar lapses were cited in the bank's financing of the Bolero Mine Project in Mexico, which defaulted within months of receiving a $420 million loan. According to the Inspector General, project vulnerabilities, quote, were not sufficiently addressed in Exxon Bank's due diligence efforts, end quote. In other cases, the bank has engaged in literally dozens of transactions with an individual or company before discovering that taxpayers were being defrauded. For example, from 2008 through 2010, Jose Quijano acted as an exporter in 96 fraudulent loan transactions insured by the XM Bank. Between 2004 and 2007, Ismael Garcia acted as a purported exporter in at least 31 fraudulent transactions involving $23 million in loans. From 2004 through 2007, Jose Falasco and others submitted false documents for 13 XM loan guarantees. The bank subsequently paid $18 million in claims on the defaulted loans. Between 2004 and 2009, Luis Moy acted as the exporter in 11 fraudulent XM Bank insured or guaranteed loans totaling $11.2 million. Fraud and corruption are not the only risks to taxpayers related to XM. The Government Accountability Office reported that the bank appears to be relying on inappropriate risk modeling 
that could produce inaccurate estimates of subsidy costs and losses. XM officials also are skirting requirements for determining the effect of export subsidies on domestic firms. Specifically, the bank omitted relevant data and analysis beyond that considered necessary to support staff recommendations for financing. Despite promises to improve matters over the years, bank officials continue to neglect due diligence, misstate losses, and exaggerate benefits. These failures are important to acknowledge as you consider whether to reauthorize the bank or allow its charter to expire. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katz. We now go to questions. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis, is recognized. Good morning, Chairman Hotchberg. When did you become aware of Mr. Gutierrez's alleged corruption? There are um, four employees who are um, under investigation and on the advice of counsel and after talking to the Inspector General not to jeopardize their case, I am really not able to talk about a criminal investigation while it is going on. So you, you can't even say when you were apprised of it, just in terms of how we evaluate your role in running the agency, not even getting into the criminal charges? My, the Inspector General has already been concerned that too much information has leaked about this. He, is, he wrote a letter. Okay. Well, let me I, I, I take your point. Was this the first time you have been made aware of possible corruption by the Export-Import Bank employees in your tenure? Yes, I have been at the bank for five years. This was the first year. So you are not aware of any other instances of employee corruption since you have been at the bank? Well, there are four cases that have been raised in the newspaper. I am familiar with those four. Now, at the uh, June 25th Financial Services hearing, Chairman Jordan referenced that you said that yesterday's Wall Street Journal article, in my opinion, is actually a good article. Um, did the Export-Import Bank need a reminder by the Wall Street Journal that it is explicitly illegal to accept bribes? No. And, and I bring that up because most Americans don't know what the Export-Import Bank is, but a lot of Americans do remember, and this was, I guess, the misconduct would have been before you got there, but it came to a head in 2009, there was a member of Congress that the FBI found thousands of dollars in his freezer, um, Congressman Jefferson. That was a very high-profile scandal. Uh, and so I guess my question is, you know, why are we here again? It has been just five years since the Export-Import Bank was at the center of one of the biggest corruption scandals in Congress, certainly in decades, and yet it is back on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So how is that a good thing? What I tried to say, uh, Congressman, is that uh, we work closely with the Inspector General. Uh, we have set a high ethical standard at the bank. We work closely with all employees to provide ethics training. We uh, instituted a multi-day course this year that was oversubscribed. Over 50 people have taken it so far. We are going to be extending that. Uh, we have a high ethical standard there. On the other hand, enforcement, the reason we have to have enforcement is not everybody plays by the rules, not everybody follows the rules. And when that does happen, and in this case, in the cases we are talking about, uh, employees at the bank referred each and every one of those to the general counsel and to the inspector general. So, because so the source of those, uh, the four instances that the Wall Street Journal referenced, the source of that were employees uh, referring that, or did those start in the context of a fraud investigation? It started with employees saying that something doesn't look right in this transaction or in this area of the bank. Okay. Um, because according to your letty, a letter to the committee, the alleged wrongdoing by Mr. Gutierrez was discovered during a fraud investigation. I think that's what you're saying. There was a transaction. People say, hey, there may be something wrong. So basically, the foreign company may be committing a fraud or the domestic company against uh, the XM Bank. Now, as I understand it, there are at least 40 outstanding fraud investigations of ban bank transactions that are outstanding. Is that correct? I don't know about the precise number. I can say this, Congressman. We, there have only been four employees. There are, could, will always be at a bank of our size uh, a number of transactions that will be under suspicion or will be investigated. No, I understand that, and I, and I agree with that. But my point is simply that if we have 40 fraud investigations, it seems as if that is kind of the way in which some of the employee misconduct can be discovered. And so if there are a uh, substantial number of outstanding fraud investigations, it stands to reason that, that there very, very well may be uh, more instances uh, of employee uh, misconduct. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, you noted in your testimony that 
the XM Bank serves to kind of level the playing field. So you have all these foreign countries that engage in um, subsidy, subsidies for their domestic industries. And I guess my question is for you is, um, why are we worried about foreign nations engaging in industrial policies? It just seems to me that I understand why that would be politically attractive, but economically it seems like it would be counterproductive because you basically have central planners who are allocating capital rather than allowing private individuals. And so if China wants to go down that road, um, China may not be experiencing the growth that they would have if they were leaving private capital to allocate itself uh, based on the private ownership. So how would you respond to that? We live in a world right now, and I, we have to partly accept the world we live in. We live in a world where there is state-directed capitalism at many, many countries. China is one, but it is not the only one. We want to make sure that when American companies are competing, if they compete against another company, it is one thing. If they are competing against China, Inc., or Korea, Inc., or Russia, Inc., and so forth, sometimes those companies are backed by those governments. We want to make sure if only if our financing is needed to level the playing field do we step in. We only step in on those rare occasions when we need it to. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back to the Chairman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, the Ranking Member, Mr. Cartwright, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hochberg, I thank you again for appearing here today, and I just want to run over a few important uh, facts with you. Uh, uh, first of all, am I correct that the Exim Bank supports 1.2 million American exporting jobs? Yes, that is okay. correct. Uh, at no cost to the taxpayer? That is correct. No okay. cost to the taxpayer. Uh, and, and this is a function to address uh, my colleague Mr. DeSantis' concern. How many other countries, it is something like 40 other countries in the developed world that have the equivalent of the American XM Bank? Isn't that true? There are actually 59 other export credit agencies around the world. 59 others in the world. And if we didn't have ours to, to help American companies compete, uh, the, the playing field would be much less level than it is today. Am I correct that in that? That is totally correct. All right. Well, nevertheless, we do have this Wall Street Journal article about uh, uh, four cases of potentially criminal misconduct, and I want to talk about that. With respect to those, I understand that on the advice of the Bank's counsel, uh, you are not able to discuss the details of those cases. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Now, we asked the Acting Inspector General whether he would be able to discuss the circumstances of those four individuals. Uh, and in a letter we received from him yesterday, he explained as follows, and I quote, quote, Disclosure of such information could seriously prejudice law enforcement efforts by alerting potential defendants to which potential witnesses and sources of information the government has obtained, unquote. Uh, to your understanding, Mr. Hochberg, is that the same reason why you were advised not to discuss the details of those cases? Precisely. All right. But, uh, Mr. Hochberg, I'm, I'm guessing it is a matter of some frustration to you that you cannot share more information uh, about the allegations of misconduct concerning these four individuals. Is that right? Yes. I mean, they are under investigation. I don't have all the facts, so I would only be making conjecture. And I share your frustration, Mr. Hochberg. But I, I understand why we can't do that here. It would be a scandal if something this committee did allowed potential defendants to avoid prosecution. And while I understand you can't share with us the details about those four individuals, uh, uh, the question is what, if anything, can you tell us about uh, any employment action the bank has taken against these individuals to date? Uh, there are four employees who are subject to an investigation, three of which have been separated from the bank. One is still on administrative leave because it was only discovered in the last six or eight weeks. Um, each one of those is subject to a potential criminal investigation and criminal charges. Um, so we are working with the Inspector General Department of Justice that is doing the full investigation. Now, in terms of timing, Mr. Hochberg, uh, as I understand it, uh, the bank took employment action against these individuals before the Wall Street Journal article uh, first appeared. Am I correct? Oh, yes, months before. So at the time the Wall Street Journal reported it back in June of this year that the bank has suspended or removed four individuals for misconduct, the bank was not only aware of the allegations, but it had already taken action, correct? That, that's totally correct. 
In a letter we received from the Inspector General yesterday, and I do ask for unanimous consent to enter this letter into the Without record. Objection. Uh, he explains that to date he has not found evidence of widespread employee misconduct or any systemic employee involvement in fraud schemes at the bank. Uh, my question is, in those instances in which employee misconduct has been alleged to have occurred, where did the tips come from and who asked the IG to investigate? Uh, in each of those cases, they came from other employees who either referred the matter initially to their supervisor or the general counsel, and then later they were on referred to the inspector general. Uh, uh, would that be a healthy indicator that the ethical training that you mentioned uh, and reporting that the Exim Bank has developed over the years has been working? Yes. I mean, I would obviously prefer to have no fraud at the bank, but I, if, we're gonna, if it ha comes up, the fact that our employees are alert to it and want to root that out is something I, I admire in our employees. And, and would you briefly explain why a commitment to ethics is important to you and the culture at the Exim Bank? Very simply, I mean, we operate at the public trust. Uh, we're, we're here to level the playing field and to support jobs. And so it's important that everybody at the bank operate at the highest ethical standards. It starts with top management. It, it continues through the training we do and making sure we have a culture that when people see something that's awry or suspicious, that they alert the proper authority so they can take a look at it. Well, thank you, sir. And I'm going to yield back to the chairman. I think the gentleman will, uh, before recognizes uh, the other gentleman from Pennsylvania, um, I would just ask the M's consent to enter in the record the CBO study, Fair Value Accounting, which estimates that the bank will cost taxpayers $2 billion over the next few years. Um, Without objection, that will be put into the record as well. Now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, uh, Mr. Meehan. I, I, I want to thank the Chairman. I thank our witnesses today for their presence here and helping us to identify a, a little more clarification of just one of the issues I know that is being raised right now. But let me just, just do some background in, in general. Mr. Hochberg, um, the Export Import Bank, it, it does what, about $50 billion a year now in, in loans? Is that accurate? That is a little high. A little La high? 30, last year 40? we did $27.4 billion. Oh, is that right? Okay. I am looking at a different statistic, but I well, see one as high as Well, export supported. So in other words, because we don't do 100 percent of any loan, so right. export supported. Last year we did 27.4, supporting about $36 billion worth of exports. Now, most of those were, we, we see frequently discussions about big companies <laughs> that are purportedly part of this process, but am I accurate in saying that Mr. Benevolio and I are having a little trouble here getting uh, eye contact with his. Uh, but um, am I accurate in, 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 in my understanding that actually about 90 percent of those loans go to small businesses? Yes, that is correct. So those are job creators back in the communities and people. You, you, at, your, at the outset of your testimony, you identified that the reason that you are in this market is that they were not able to get financing at traditional bank markets. Do you have a second where you could explain that? Uh, certainly. I mean, you know, one, I was a small business owner myself and a family business for 20 years. And I remember this personally, and I see this when I meet with small business owners around the country. It is always more difficult for a small business owner to get financing, ever more so when they also have customers that are overseas and they are exporting. It is still more foreign. We are becoming more of an export nation, but generally speaking, it is even more difficult when they are exporting. The, um Ms. Katz, I know you raised some points about confidence within the institution. I'm not, I, I, I did have to uh, laugh to myself. You were concerned because 40, 42 percent of the employees within the institution seem to have confidence in the standards of honesty and integrity. I'm, what do you think the percentage of American citizens would be if they asked about the sense of confidence of honesty and integrity of members of Congress today? I'm not sure that's. That is the right standard, Congressman, that I, yeah. that I would use. I just, the people are cynical about a lot of things these, these days. But I, I, I just sort of say that facetiously. But, but very seriously, I mean, I am as concerned as anybody about the concept of fraud at an institution like this. But as a former Federal prosecutor, I have to say to you that the concept of fraud at any institution in which there are transactions that take place is really not that foreign a concept. In fact, we deal with it on a regular basis. Unfortunately, it seems to be human nature. Would you explain to me why we can't 
resolve these issues by effective investigations and prosecutions like we do in many parts of, uh, of our society? We do resolve many of them, dozens of, the, of cases in the, in the, uh, with respect to, to the bank. Uh, however, I think that we dozens are, have, have there been dozens of prosecutions? Certainly. There have been dozens. Okay. Oh, certainly, if not more than that. Uh, I think you know the the issue is that there is a record um, of mismanagement within the bank and a lack of, of standards within the bank uh, that create an environment that is particularly ripe for fraud and other wrongdoing, and that is the concern. I don't think that it's, it's good enough to say, well, there is corruption everywhere or there is fraud everywhere, and therefore we can expect it at the bank. I think the expectations should be that our public institutions are doing everything in their power to minimize the amount of fraud and corruption that exists, and I don't think that that is necessarily the case here. Ms. Katz, I, I, or Ms. Trockberg, I, well, well, I, I will, may, and let me ask a question, and then you, you, you can respond to it. I mean, I had a period where I actually um, had the responsibility to sit on the Corporate Fraud Task Force in my previous time as a U.S. Attorney because we were seeing this kind of issue throughout corporate institutions all the way. One of the resolutions, of course, were in addition to increased prosecutions, were the beginning of better compliance, the beginning of better kinds of internal controls. Mr. Hochberg, now aware of some of the concerns, are you prepared and are there steps in place to begin to put the kind of compliance programs and internal controls that would give the taxpayers confidence that decisions that are being made are being made on the merits and not for any kind of uh, nefarious purposes? We are continually, <coughs> excuse me, we have an auditing firm, an outside auditor, Deloitte and Touche, we have an audit committee, we have General Accountability Office, the Inspector General, all of which give us recommendations on how to make the bank run better, how to run better, more efficiently, with less incidents or less potential fraud, waste or abuse. And we have taken those recommendations and we are continually working to improve that. I, I don't want to make one comment when, when Ms. Katz said there are dozens. There are only four employees. There may be companies we look at uh, on the outside trying to defraud the Federal Government, but that is separate from employees. So I think we just need to make sure those are really two separate issues. Well, thank you for drawing that clarification. And, Mr. Chairman, my time is up. I thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from uh, Illinois, the Honorable Ms. Duckworth, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to thank my colleague from Pennsylvania, Ms. Amian, for mentioning the Exim Bank's support for small businesses. In fact, last summer, over 100 businesses attended a forum just in my one district alone in Schaumburg, Illinois, to learn more about the benefits of Exim Bank. Since then, the businesses in my district have told me time and again how the bank's services keep them competitive in the global marketplace. Um, Exim Bank is a job creator, and it plays a critical role in the economy in my home state of Illinois, which is the fifth largest exporting state in our country. At no cost to the taxpayers, it supported 1,600 jobs in my district alone and more than 200,000 across the country. And in fact, two weeks ago, um, uh, with the, uh, grave concerns for uh, the Exim Bank, the National Association of Manufacturers local chapter in my district asked for a meeting with me um, where they brought up uh, the importance of um, uh, uh, renewing the Exim Bank's charter. And in fact, um, uh, attending that meeting, in addition to the Vice President of Technology Factory Automation at Boss Rex Roth Corporation, I also had um, the President of the National Marine Manufacturers Association, which is a collection of small businesses who build pleasure boats for the entire around the nation. And um, uh, one particular business in my district, Quality Float Works uh, in Illinois, in, um, who just won a $3 million contract uh, with the nation of Saudi Arabia um, to provide some, some services, and yet they cannot get the loan guarantee that they need for the million dollars in supplies and equipment. Um, they will lose this contract that they have been competing for for many, many years, and it equates to an entire shift that they would add to their factory, people that will be out of work um, in my district if um, uh, they can't get this, this loan guarantee um, from the Exim Bank. In short, the bank is critical to small businesses, manufacturers, and job creators in my district and all over the United States. I agree that no organization is immune from having bad actors within its ranks at some point. The question is, what processes 
does the organization have in place to ensure that bad actors are caught and held accountable? I wanted to clarify something that Ms. Katz said. She said that of the dozens and dozens of cases that have been, um, referred, have been referred to prosecution, but in fact, the Office of the Inspector General has said that, um, and has not found any evidence of system, systemic corrup corruption among SM Bank employees. According to the OIG, blank employees Bank employees have not been implicated in any of the 70 instances in which fraud was referred to prosecution. Um, and, and my understanding, um, Mr. Hochberg, is that these four employees um, that are currently under investigation were actually discovered by the bank itself. Is that not correct? That is correct. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about um, the bank's role in the global economy? What are our competitors doing? Um, would U.S. businesses fall behind without the Exxon Bank? Thank you, Congresswoman. And uh, we actually do issue and just recently issued to Congress uh, at the end of June an annual competitiveness report. Uh, this is a report that is mandated by Congress where we survey customers and exporters and other export credit agencies to see how competitive we are. As I mentioned to Congressman Cartwright, there are 59 other export credit agencies and, and uh, government agencies supporting exports around the world. Um, we are in a period of the most brutal competition for exports and hence jobs. Uh, country after country is trying to export their way out of their economic malaise. And so U.S. companies, and again, 90 percent of the companies we work with are small businesses as defined by the SBA, have a very tough time getting both the financing and competing to head to head. So we make sure if the private sector isn't there and there is a reasonable assurance of repayment that we can step in and make sure that sale happens and supports jobs in our country, not overseas. One of the things, um, Mr. Hochberg, that Quality Floatworks told me about their concern with Saudi Arabia and this one um, uh, contract in particular that they have been fighting for three years to finally win is the slow pay aspect. Can you talk a little bit about what XM does in terms of helping small businesses be able to survive after they provide services for um, people that do pay but are slow? Uh, that is a particular problem. Uh, it is a particular problem in a number of countries, the one you mentioned, and, and I have heard that frequently mentioned. What we do is we provide, our, we can, we provide insurance. So a customer, a U.S. company, the way they buy theft insurance or fire insurance, we will sell them credit insurance so they can insure their receivables so that they know they are going to get paid. And they can also give dating. So if they provide, say, 60 or 90-day terms to their customer, once they have a receivable insured by the U.S. government, they can go to their bank and borrow against it. It becomes a collateral part of their, what they call their borrowing base. So then they can get the cash flow, and we can also assist in that. We provide a 90 percent guarantee, if needed by a local bank, to make the loan to give them working capital so that they have the cash flow to fulfill the order. Thank you. I am out of time. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Mr. Hochberg, uh, does Mr. Gutierrez still, uh, is he still employed at the XM Bank? He is not an employee. What were the financial terms of Mr. Gutierrez's dismissal from the bank? He was dismissed from the bank. Uh, is he receiving any compensation now, any taxpayer compensation now, any compensation from the bank? Uh, he is not. All right. Um, Mr. Hochberg, there have been four people identified in the Wall Street Journal as being part of this, um, being under investigation, four employees. Are the other three also, have the other three also been dismissed from the bank? Uh, three, including Mr. Gutierrez, has been dismissed. One is on administrative leave pending investigation. And the one on administrative leave is still receiving compensation from the bank? That is correct. All right. Uh, can you tell me who the other three individuals are? Can you name those other three? I cannot name them. I have been asked since they are under criminal investigation. And Mr. Jordan, as you know, you are an attorney. I don't want to jeopardize that case so that it cannot be prosecuted. So who has specifically law. told you that you can't tell us, uh, identify who those individuals well, if are? You, the letter from the Inspector General. No, no, no. I am asking you, did the Inspector General say to you, Mr. Hochberg, don't tell Congress the names of the other three individuals under investigation? Did he explicitly tell you that, make that statement to you? I was told by our counsel. I am not asking about your counsel. I am asking about the Inspector General. Not to discuss this. Yes, he said not to discuss this. He said not to disclose the names of the, th of the other three individuals under investigation, one on paid leave, still receiving compensation. He said don't tell, who, don't tell the American people, don't tell Congress who they are. They are under investigation, and you know and I know I cannot discuss this. What statute says you can't? 
I am trying to make sure that if they have done wrongdoing, I want them to be prosecuted is, and removed and, it, and to the full extent of the law. Is there any law that says you can't disclose to a congressional committee doing appropriate investigation about an agency where there is fraud, alleged fraud, alleged bribe take place and you can't disclose those names? Can you name the statute? Mr. Chairman, I would certainly Because I can't name one. I am not an attorney, but I am not going to jeopardize the case. I am not either. Case. But I know there is no statute. I am not going to jeopardize the case because I would like these employees, if they are guilty, to be found guilty and to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. So do we. But we would also like to know that information when we are doing an investigation. This, this is, we had this debate um, just last week. Mr. Gowdy raised the same question. We always say, oh, we can't, we can't give you information. We can't give you documents because there is an ongoing investigation. Well, we would like to know. When, will you, when do you think you will be able to tell us who those other three are? Mr. Jordan, I will read you what the Inspector General said. The longstanding policy and practice of Federal law I want to know what the Inspector General told you. I am not asking the Inspector General, Mr. Hochberg. I am asking you. Did the Inspector General specifically tell you, don't tell this committee who is under investigation? Did he say that to you? I am reading from this letter and I am not disclosing that information. I can I read a letter. I am asking you. You are the witness today under oath. I am asking you, why can't you tell us who the four people are? We know one and he just took the fifth. We would like to know the other three. I cannot disclose those names to the public. It's, uh, I mean, w when do you think you will be able to? Sometime after September 30th? If, Not before September if 30th? It depends if they are indicted. If they are indicted, that becomes a public, that, then it becomes a public information. Let's go to this. Let's, let's change gears. Um, did you give 10 million, did the Export Import Bank give $10 million to Solyndra in 2011? No, we did not. Our understanding is $10 million in loan guarantees occurred. Uh, John Scott, former Vice President of Solyndra, touted the expedited manner in which XM Bank granted Solyndra a loan guarantee, stating it benefited from a, fa quote, fast due diligence process. So the Export Import Bank did not help in any way financing Solyndra. Well, that wasn't the original question. We financed a company in Belgium that purchased products from Solyndra. We, we generally do long-term financing of foreign buyers who are, com who are looking at U.S. goods versus Chinese goods versus foreign goods, and, to and if it requires... So you did help with Solyndra. No, I, we financed a Belgian company that... No, I understand how it works. I, I understand US how the Export-Import Bank works, but it was tied to Solyndra, correct? It was, they made a purchase from Solyndra. That's well, yeah, correct. that's how the bank works. So how about, how about Abound Solar? Did you do 9.2 million loan guarantee to Abound Solar? I would have to look at what they trans. I, I look, we, well, we make loans, Mr. Chairman, to the foreign buyers who are buying from U.S. companies. Right. I understand. Both the Bound Solar and Cylinder went bankrupt. Um, we have had this committee has done a lot of, of uh, examination of the loan guarantee program. And um, we just, I just found it amazing that you were also tied in with the very companies in the loan guarantee program where, which lost taxpayer money to Solyndra, Bound Solar, Beacon Power, and others that you have given money to, the, to, to benefit those, those, uh, those same companies. Let me go back to you, Ms. Katz, real quickly. You mentioned the, the number 74 in your testimony. Tell me about that again. Those are administrative actions that were reported taken by the Inspector General uh, following integrity investigations at the, at the agency. So, uh, 70, closed investigations where they found well, serious What's referred to? There's not a lot of transparency, as you might imagine, with the with these things. But an administrative actions are responses by the XM Bank to stop transactions, cancel policies, or protect funds at risk based upon investigative findings. All right. Thank you. Uh, last thing before I run out of time here, um, Mr. Hochberg. Uh, again, just just for the record, no one. The Inspector General didn't explicitly tell you not to share with Congress the identities of the, the other three individuals under investigation, yes or no? I have been advised not to disclose the names of the individuals who are under investigation, not to jeopardize okay. their case. And who was that? Who, who advised you not to? Our your, your counsel? Our counsel. XM counsel? And working with the Inspector General. Who advised you, counsel or Inspector General? Mr. Jordan, both I, met with the, I meet with the Inspector General on a regular basis. I meet with him every month, as I mentioned to you. And he, when these have come up, he has said not to discuss them. All right. I thank the gentleman. I would yield now to the, uh, Ms. Kelly. Generally, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am glad that this panel is here today because I know how critical XM is to my district. 301 companies and 36,000 jobs in my state depend on XM reauthorization. So, um, Ms. Katz, I would like to speak about your testimony. 
I'd like to know a little bit more about the research that went into your assertions, because you seem to rely on reports from the IG and GAO as the basis for your assertions. Did you personally conduct any type of investigations into allegations of fraud or corruption at Ex-Im Bank? I reported on what the uh, Inspector General has um, issued and his reports to Congress, as well as the uh, Government Accountability Office. And I believe that both of those bodies are considered to be pretty reputable when it comes to to their, uh, to their reports. Did you interview whistleblowers with direct knowledge, for instance? No, I did not. Okay. So you personally didn't do any investigation? I just do um, data analysis. Okay. Did you ever speak with the IG to understand their assessment as to whether the bank, in fact, is rife with fraud or corruption? I didn't need to do that based on the numbers that the IG reported. It was pretty, uh, pretty evident what the degree of uh, fraud is as they reported it. Okay. So uh, let me get this straight. You have testified that there is a record of fraud and corruption at XM Bank, and you haven't personally conducted any investigation into such allegations, nor have you ever spoken to the IG for their views on whether such a record exists. Is that well, right? Uh, Representative, that right? their views are pretty plain, and if you would like to see I'm the reports, I'm just asking you, is that right? If you'd like to see the reports in which they make those views uh, plain, then I'd be happy to send those to you. But is that right? What I'm asking you? Are you asking me? Am I I'm a police you, detective? You, I'm not. No, I didn't ask you that. I just asked you if you personally conducted any investigations or if you've ever spoken to the IG. That's all I'm asking. I've not spoken to the IG. I've read his the, the okay. office and um, IG's reports. And uh, I don't do um, criminal investigations, but I do do data analysis. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It would seem to me that on this issue of whether XM Bank is rife with employee fraud and corruption, this committee should be hearing from the folks who have firsthand knowledge about any such investigations, namely the IG. Uh, fortunately for us, the IG sent a letter, which has been talked about. And when we take a look at the letter, the IG expressly states that since 2009, in the 71 indictments his office has secured against individuals who attempted to defraud the bank, none were against employees of XM Bank. Ms. Katz, do you agree that it is important for the public to understand that none of the indictments the IG has secured has involved XM Bank employees? Well, the, inform the, the public should have all information about the bank. But do, do you, I, I just need you to answer that question. I think I am. The, the fact that, they, um, that there haven't been indictments doesn't necessarily mean that there hasn't been corruption. Right, but it doesn't mean that it has either. It seems to me pretty relevant that there are no criminal indictments or information for corruption at the bank since 2009 and that all criminal prosecutions have been brought against companies and individuals outside the bank who seek to steal taxpayers' dollars. My testimony dealt with fraud cases specifically. I don't think that I made any allegations uh, with reference to uh, employee corruption. I was very careful about that. Another thing the IG notes in his letter to the committee is that, to date, his office has not developed evidence of widespread employee misconduct or systematic employee involvement in fraud schemes at the bank. And just so we are clear, up until today, were you aware that the IG's office found no evidence of any systemic employee involvement in any fraud scheme, or are you just learning that today? I am aware of the fraud investigations that the IG has undertaken, and that is where my focus has been. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The, the, uh, the gentleman from uh, Maryland, the ranking member of the committee, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Uh, Hatchberg, um, there is a uh, Bloomberg article dated July 25, 2014, uh, entitled House of Subpoena XM Worker as time runs out for the bank, uh, I ask unanimous consent that it be admitted into the record. Without Chairman? Without objection. Thank you very much. And in that article, uh, Chairman Issa says, and I quote, many of us support the concept of making sure there is an availability of funds to support competitiveness in exports, but we have to make sure that the American people believe it is being spent fairly and honestly. Republican members are concerned about what they have called a culture of corruption 
at the bank based on one Wall Street Journal article identifying four incidents of employee misconduct. However, we know that since 2009, the IG has secured 71 indictments or criminal charges against parties who have attempted to defraud the bank, none of which were against employees of the XM Bank. That tells me a, a very simple fact, um, that there exists across the government, and we see this across government. There are individuals who create business entities whose sole intent is to defraud the government, and in this case, defraud the XM Bank. There seems to be a legitimate oversight concern for the outside parties that are attempting to defraud the bank, and that is very, very important. Mr. Hotchberg, I would like to discuss some of the anti-fraud efforts at the bank and the results of those efforts. And I want to go through these things because I think that is, we need to be clear on the record of what is going on at the bank and what is not, because there are people whose careers are, could be tainted based on uh, inaccurate information. One indicator of fraud is the default rate. Is that correct? Is that one of the things that you all look at? Yes, sir. Currently, your default rate is approximately 0 0.2 percent. Is that correct? Actually, yes. A drop less than that, even. I'm sorry? A slightly less than that. What is it? It is 0.194 percent, less than one-fifth of 1 percent. Mr. Hochberg, in your testimony, you state that the bank works with its IG to establish an effective monitoring and enforcement program for fraud and ethical misconduct. The IG has notified the committee that it works with the bank employees to identify potential fraud schemes in the early stages. Do you agree that bank employees play an important role in detecting part fraud? Without question. And why do you say that? Well, because in these, in these four cases uh, where, where the other employees, it was detected by employees, and our employees go through a rigorous e uh, ethical training. Uh, as I mentioned, upon joining the bank, we actually even have a handy guy they can keep at their desk. Um, we have a seven-member staff uh, that is in the ethics department in the legal counsel's office that fields questions, how do they deal with situations, how do, is this an ethical uh, uh, behavior. We also just began conducting this year training how to detect fraud in outside agencies, outside contractors, outside entities. So this is a big, sounds like this is a big deal for you all. It is a very big deal. Listen, the public trust is essential for us doing a good job. And so we take that very seriously. I take that very seriously, and so does our ethics staff. Now, the IG also stated that the most common fraud schemes involve outside parties obtaining loans through false representations and submission of false documents. Is that correct, Mr. Hartford? That is correct. However, Republicans ignore this fact and instead choose to examine allegations of corruption reported in the Wall Street Journal with no other information. I am concerned with the uh, evidence of outside parties attempting to defraud the bank. These were incidents which were revealed following an IG investigation based on referrals by bank employees. That is correct. So it, it is concerning that my Republican colleagues almost ignore the evidence of misconduct by outsiders and the role of bank employees in, in identifying potential fraud. Instead, the majority focuses on what appears to be a few isolated incidents. And don't get me wrong, if somebody is doing something wrong, we ought to deal with that. But again, I, I just wanted to make sure the record is clear. And just one other thing, uh, Ms. Katz, in answering Ms. Kelly's question, Congresswoman Kelly's question, did I hear you say um, you made no allegations of employee corruption? Is that I wrote it down? Is that what you said? Uh, yes, sir. Very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, I, I think, gentlemen, isn't it true, Ms. Katz, that when you do the outside fraud investigation, that's when you find out that there may be some problems on the inside? Isn't that how it normally works, Ms. Katz? Well, certainly if there is widespread fraud, it should raise questions or at least concerns that the internal But isn't that how the, the, the Mr. Jefferson was identified? Isn't that how these four individuals who are now being talked about today were identified? There was an outside concern, and then that caused the focus on the inside, and you found employees who were doing some things wrong? Yes. Okay. 
I mean, that, that, that's why they, I mean, it is all important, but that is what leads to potential uh, wrongdoing on folks uh, exactly. on, on the inside. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank both you and the Ranking Member for allowing me the courtesy of being here today. This is not my first uh, Export-Import Bank hearing, as you can probably imagine. We have had several over in House Financial Services. So it is not the first time I have heard some of the numbers that we have discussed today, some of the testimony that we have discussed today. Um, but I just want to encourage that you are not, not hearing both sides of the story. Um, we hear, for example, Mr. Cartwright collectively pointed out in his opening testimony that uh, 87 percent of the transactions at the Export-Import Bank involve small business. Um, there is a flip side to that, which is that they are supposed to have 20 percent, just 20 percent of their volume go to small business. They have missed that target regularly. So while the transactions are high, the number of dollars that actually go to small business are very small and smaller than they are obligated to be by law. We heard Mr. Hochberg talk about how he is um, only interested in leveling the playing field. Fair enough. Only one-third of the bank, what the bank does actually goes towards level, leveling the playing field. You could get rid of two-thirds of the bank tomorrow and still have the one-third of the bank that is actually used to level the playing field. Finally, Mr. Cartwright uh, correctly mentioned out um, that oftentimes this has not been controversial. Um, I don't have to remind my Democrat friends. It was actually then Senator Barack Obama in 2008 who said that um, this was corporate welfare and needed to be cut back. So there are two sides to those stories. There's the la what I want to focus on most now today, though, is jobs, because we hear a lot of talk in here about jobs. Um, and I think if we take a close look at how the bank talks about jobs, we might get some insight into the, let's call it the unhealthy culture uh, at the Export-Import Bank, uh, what Ms. Katz calls, I think correctly, the, this record of mismanagement. Um, let's look at how they talk about jobs. The GAO in May of 2013 was extraordinarily critical of how the bank talked about jobs. They were um, concerned with how the bank counted. For example, they don't make distinguish, uh, 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 distinctions between full-time and part-time work. They don't make distinctions between domestic jobs and international jobs. They haven't figured out a way yet to count the jobs that, for example, are created by Boeing in Japan. And that goes into the number. They, they express concern, the GAO did, about the language that they use. They say support jobs. No one knows what that means. It's not create jobs. And I don't think anybody's taking the position, at least Mr. Hopper, it's not that he's created 1.2 million jobs. We use this, this nebulous term called support that no one really knows what it means, and the GAO says that that's troublesome. But it's why they count the jobs that I want my colleagues to think about the most. The GAO report asked the bank, why do you report this? Are you obligated by statute to tell Congress about the number of jobs that you support? And the GAO said, no. One of our Board of Trustees members asked us to start doing that a couple years ago so that we could make it clear to Congress the good that we do. I suggest to you that it's possible that maybe they fudge the numbers a little bit and that it's insight into what is going on at the bank. And, and my, my contention is that what we see here is, is why th th this is a, a bureaucracy, a bureaucracy that is not primarily interested in helping small business or creating or supporting jobs, but a bureaucracy that is first and foremost interested in justifying its own existence and maintaining its own level of funding. Um, Ms. Kelly asked a good question, Ms. Katz. Has she talked to the IG? Has she talked to the GAO? She has not. I have. We had that opportunity in House Financial Services. The GAO and the IG over the last four years have identified 76 difficulties within the bank. 76 shortcomings, some of which may have led to some of the outside fraud that we talked about today. One of the things the bank was not doing is actually making sure that the outside lenders were doing credit checks on people who were using the bank facilities. Same thing that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not doing before the housing crisis. 76 meaningful things that the IG and the GAO said were wrong at the bank. Half of them have not been, uh, not been fixed in the last four years. Nine of them, the bank doesn't even admit, are a problem and they are refusing to try and fix them. So I think that, as we take a look over what the culture is at the bank and how the bank operates and why the bank operates, leads to my question, which is this, Mr. Hotberg, the, the, the thing that we did not have at Financial Services, which is the results of the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey results, which say that uh, only 42 percent of your employees have a, uh, think that the organizational leaders maintain high standards of honesty and integrity, and just about half feel like they can disclose suspected violations of law. You have been there five years. The Obama administration has been in charge for five years. Where does this come from, if not from the top? Congressman Mulvaney, I appreciate your coming here and providing these questions, because you have here and at the uh, Financial Services Committee. Um, 
I take very seriously the employee, Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. We do it every year. We encourage our employees to, to, to fill it out. Um, there are many areas the bank excelled. There are a number of areas that are dissatisfaction. We have a lot of dissatisfaction on workload. The workload more than doubled in the last few years. People do not have the resources. Congress has added those resources. And when you look at the survey, when you look at both positive and neutral, if you put those two together, uh, Exim had about a 75 percent rating. Government wide was 80 percent. Where We're does short. the 42 percent? Where does a 42 percent approval rating, positive approval rating, on leaders' high standards of honesty and integrity come from? If not from the top, we are, w this is an area we're working on. It's not an a area for improvement. There are areas in this survey we excelled. There's some areas that need improvement. We could this go further if you want to, uh, and I could ask you about um, the approval rating. On I have a high level of respect for my organization's senior leaders, 38 percent. How satisfied are you with the policies and practices of your senior leaders, 24.8 percent? It comes from the top, does it? You have had five years to work on those types of things, haven't you? Congressman Mulvaney, we have a high ethical standard. We have seven people in our ethics department. I look at our default rates. I look at our performance to Congress. I look at our financial performance. We have 25 years of unqualified, clean audits from outside independent auditors from PricewaterhouseCoopers for a number of years and Deloitte Touche. They it would indicate if there was a problem at the bank, they would show up in those numbers. Thank you very much. I have already overstayed my time. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, I would encourage you, if you decide to further pursue this, to bring in the IG and bring in the GAO um, and ask them uh, what they think, if they think the bank has lived up to their expectations in, in, in getting their house in order. And I appreciate the time and the opportunity. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Maryland. It is unanimous consent that he be allowed Mr. Mulvaney is on, I am not on financial services, but he has made a lot of allegations. And I just, if there, I saw you scribbling stuff, I would just like to hear, hear what his answer is. Gentlemen, I mean, we had wonderful testimony from Mr. Mulvaney. I would like to hear from I, the witness. I agree. Uh, uh, Mr. Hochberg can, uh, can respond. Thank you. Um, well, there are a number of allegations. There are a lot going on here. Let me try and uh, re uh, respond to the few notes I took. One, this year, about 22, 23 percent of all dollars are going to small business entities, so in excess of the 20 percent that is uh, required by Congress, that is a should uh, reach by Congress. We have put more efforts into reaching small businesses and do more with small businesses in terms of dollar volume than the bank has ever done. We have done more loans to small businesses in these five years than the previous eight years combined. So that, is that 23 percent of of direct uh, uh, defined as directly going to small business, or is that routed through larger corporations who then work with small business? No, that actually is direct. If you okay. add, if you want to be clear, if, if you add the indirect, which I believe is actually should be part of it, is something we've asked Congress to allow because, frankly, large companies in district after district, Congresswoman. So you're Duffer, saying the GAO is wrong? Mr. Mulvaney cited the GAO said that it wasn't 20 percent. You're saying they're wrong. This year, this year, the year we are in, we are nine months into the year, we are at 22, 23 percent. All right. That was one question. In terms of the jobs number, GAO actually did not, they validated our methodology. We used the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We don't make up these numbers. We actually use hard data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and apply it to the actual exports that we do. That is where the number comes from. What GAO asked us to do was to provide greater transparency on the methodology, but they did not dispute the methodology. Um, we have <clears throat> 78 recommendations from the Inspector General. We have, uh, we have closed 33 of those. We have sent another 20 that are being in discussion with the Inspector General. We have 16 that are actually open, that are in discussion. We are working with, GAO, with the Inspector General. What are the recommendations? understanding how we can implement them, whether we need systems or people or change of methodology. And we have two that are, quote, unquote, unresolved that we are actually having a debate with the Inspector General whether they are warranted or not. When, so when, two out of 78 are actually have any degree of contention whatsoever. We have accepted otherwise all the other recommendations of, of the Inspector General and have put them into place. But 38 have been implemented. Was that the number you gave, 38 out of 78? 30 33 are actually closed. Okay, which so means totally closed. Totally the others done. are either in process of being implemented, and as I said, only two are being discussed. And when did you receive all these recommendations? They come. They've been over over the years. Some of them over take several years. Some, some of them take technology. Some of them take uh, IT support to change. So 
But we have been working diligently. I mean, the Inspector General has said that we have, we have been fulfilled uh, their requirements. I have not had an objection from the IG saying that we have not been cooperative, haven't worked with them, haven't accepted their recommendations. Yeah, so you have done 33 of the 78. You have completed 33 of the 78 you have received. 33 are closed. The rest were, were in the process of But that is what we look at. That. We look at getting to the finish line and actually getting the job done. 33 of 78, I think, was Mr. Mulvaney's point. That is less than half. Less than half have been totally closed and right. the others I, are in I work. understand what you are saying, but I am just saying, to Mr. 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 Point. Chairman, there will always be items in the work. We will never get to I zero. It that. is impossible to get I to zero. I understand that. I understand that. But uh, we want to be clear and define these things accurately. The gentlelady from why did, 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 Mr. did the gentleman have another point to make? The only other point I would make, actually, is usually just the members get to filibuster, not the witness, but I am letting you go. You are very, you're a very kind chairman, sir. All right. Uh, in the last decade, when the, some of the items that Ms. Katz was referring to, we have processed over 33,220 well, applicants. Let me ask you about this. Let me just do one thing, since, since we got this extended dialogue with you, Mr. Mulvaney. I will let Nick jump back in, if he, Mr. Mulvaney jump back in if he would like. But he raised the issue that half the employees who took the survey said they can't trust their leadership. Now, you, you got a page and a half about ethics and training and all this stuff in your written testimony. I read it last night. You, make a big, you made a big deal of it when you, when you made your opening statement. You made a big deal to a number of members. But, so you can, you can trumpet all that you want, but the fact remains half the people who work for you who took the survey said, I am not really confident in sharing information about dishonesty and potential problems. I am not comfortable sharing that. Mr. Chairman, half, half, if you add also those who are neutral said they didn't have a real opinion on it, it is 75 Well, maybe because they are scared, too. No, but it is 75 percent, and the Federal Government average is 80 percent. We are uh, below the average. Well, if you I would add like it that be, way, yeah, if you, if you mix this and that and come up with everything else, well, no, yeah, well that is uh, look, apple at the pie and butterflies. I am looking at the facts, and I am saying, yes, we are below, we're below the federal, sta federal average. I would like to get higher, the but let us put, put it in context. The people who let's answered put it the in survey, context. a bunch of them said, I don't want to answer. And 50 of them, 50 percent who did said, you know what, I don't have much trust. That's a problem. That is a real problem. So maybe, maybe this, maybe we would, wouldn't have all this fraud, these investigations, if you could have people who are willing to, to come forward and, and, and feel confident that they could, they could give that information to the folks that they work for. Well, I all I'm saying is that's a concern. I go back to what the in Inspector General said in his letter to the committee yesterday. There is no not developed any evidence of widespread employee misconduct or systematic employee Maybe those same people are afraid to talk to him. <laughs> the gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized for Thank you. Gen Wait, excuse me one second. The gentleman from South Carolina have an additional you get a, we'll, we'll Just to follow up on Mr. Cummings' inquiries, because I, I, I appreciate the information, Mr. Hopper. I obviously appreciate the back and forth, something we don't get to do on the, on the other committee. Uh, I, I do want to read the executive summary of, of just one of the things, the GAO summary regarding the jobs. Uh, and I'm going to read verbatim from the very closing of the summary. It's one sentence. Because of a lack of reporting on the assumptions and limitations of its methodology and data, Congressional and public stakeholders may not fully understand what the jobs number that XM uh, reports represents and the extent to which XM's financing may have affected U.S. employment. Um, and there's a couple other things, but I won't go line by line. I guess my point was very similar to what the Chairman's was. If you've got a circumstance where 40 percent of only 40 percent of the people working at a place are comfortable in blowing the whistle, and you require you're relying on those people to bring waste, fraud, and abuse to your attention, then it's likely that you're missing at least half of the waste, fraud, and abuse. And that you're right, you did rely on the on, on you, I think you mentioned earlier you relied on people within your organization to bring the current four uh, circumstances to your attention, which is great. But when you've got a culture where a majority of people are afraid to bring that to your attention, it makes me worry as a member of Congress who has some oversight over this particular institution, that you are not catching enough of it. Well, it is not a majority that said that. A majority, I mean, if you take those who said they have the confidence and those who are neutral don't either feel one way or another. Mr. Hopper, if I take the neutral the people and put them on the, on the other side, then, there's, then, there's 60, then I get my 60 percent. I mean, the bottom line is only 42 percent of the people said they were comfortable doing that. You, you could take the people in the middle, you are absolutely right, and move them either way. That is why you don't count them. <laughs> Great point. Gentlelady from 
Wyoming is recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'd like the staff to put up the impex timeline because I'm going to concentrate on the impex issue, Mr. Hochberg. Um, so let's walk through the bank's relationship with impex associates. That's the Florida exporter that is alleged to have bribed Mr. Gutierrez. Do you know when the bank first approved a deal with impex associates? Looks to me like it was 2002. Okay. Um, and when did the banks to the Office of Inspector General for in investigation of fraud? I un uh, well, first of all, it's before my time. You know, I did not join the bank until 2009. So okay. Well, it looks to me like it was December 2009 from this chart, and the basis for the never existed and that the transaction was suspected to be fraudulent, right? Uh, you are more familiar with that. As I said, this was referred to the uh, and, and the, uh, our general counsel in 2009. Okay. And in fact, reading the details of this referral, it, goes, it says, Impex Associates has been the exporter on more than 10 Exim Bank financed insurance at least six of these transactions have resulted in claims to date. Now, I think that that is uh, up on the slide as well. So the bank was paying out taxpayer money on 60 percent of impex deals, and it did Congresswoman, first of all, Exim Bank got an Inspector General in 2007. This, came to, this was referred to the Inspector General. That is when the office was established in 2009. And under my tenure, and, under, and once the Inspector General was there, that is when this, this issue came to a head. Okay, and so you have, you have over six, seven years beforehand when it went undetected by staff, and General Counsel went, Bank, and so forth. It is amazing that it went undetected. It, in fact, it is kind of stunning because Impex's fraud was open and it was notorious. There was a lawsuit, 2006 Federal lawsuit, via Sulu versus Diaz. And it had a 69-page complaint laying out in precise detail exactly how Impex Associates is a scheme to defraud the Export-Import Bank. This lawsuit was publicly filed in open court. How, how could it have been missed? Congresswoman, before my time at the bank, I was not there until 2009. I can't really opine on what happened in 2006, 7, or 8 before I arrived at the bank. But that doesn't make the sins of XM and not monitoring this stuff forgivable. It only makes you forgivable. How did the bank go on to approve seven more transactions for loan guarantees and insurance? I was not at the bank. I cannot answer that question. Now, what have you done then to make sure this never happens again. Well, I believe we have, a, uh, contrary to some members of this committee, we have a culture of ethics. We have actually ethics training. I have got a seven people in our general counsel's office, uh, in, and plus the general counsel as well. We, as I mentioned, we have an ethics manual that every new employee does. We review that every year. We have offered courses. Before employees this year started, we were, they were oversubscribed, where employees can actually help them detect fraud on behalf of outside entities. So companies like an Impex, that employees are more alert to what, would, what should they be looking for in those transactions. Those are the kinds of things we put in place. Well, what they should be looking for at least at a minimum is open court records that document precisely the fraud that was perpetrated on Exim Bank. I, I have additional time. I would like to yield to uh, the Chairman. Thank the gentlelady for, for yielding. Uh, Mr. Hochberg, would, um, did, you, did the bank itself investigate how Mr. Gutierrez's name became public? Uh, the inspector well, let me ask you let me ask it first this way. How did his name get public? I have no idea. And now, did you investigate how it went public? In our earlier exchange, you told me that. Council told me can't talk about it, can't disclose the names. OIG, the, the Inspector General said, you know, advised us not to do that. At least in, in a letter, I, he didn't say it to you directly. So uh, you made a you made a big to deal. This um, did you did you if you care so much about that not becoming public, did you investigate how one name did get public? 
I had a discussion with the Inspector General, and they are looking into how this became public. No, did you inside, internally, did this? You have made a big deal. These seven lawyers, you have hired this big pamphlet you have held up several times, booklet you have held up several times, two and a half pages of your testimony talking about ethics, even though half the people are nervous about the folks who above them and can't, feel like they can't be honest. You made a big deal of this. And so it seems to me if something went public that wasn't supposed to go public, you would be all over it. You would investigate that. And you are telling me you didn't investigate it? No, I didn't. I spoke to the Inspector General about it and said, what, how are we getting to the bottom of this? Did your this lawyers, are these seven people in the ethics at all, did, did they look into it? Not the Inspector General. Did you guys look into it? It is one thing to have the Office of the Inspector General look into it. Another thing, if you guys internally look at it, did you do that? We referred this to the Inspector General because it was a break. You didn't do any of your own internal investigation? We referred it to the Inspector General. Do you know today, testifying before Congress, how Mr. Gutierrez's name became public, how the Wall Street Journal got his name and said he is under investigation for bribery and fraud? Do you know how that got public? I do not. No, no idea? I do not. And does anyone, else in, in, does, does anyone else outside the Inspector General's office, to your knowledge, at the Export-Import Bank know how his name became public? At the current time, no. All right. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Hubbard, I just have you know, some questions here. Let's, let's uh, go over. I think there is a lot of concern, as noted in this hearing, about uh, the, the bank and some of its dealings and some of the things we are reading uh, in the headlines. So let's just uh, start with a few things, and we can do that, okay? According to the, Congre uh, the CBO, the, the, and over the next 10 years, XM IM's six largest programs will generate $14 billion under the government standard accounting framework. However, when CBO applies the private sector accounting framework, the fair value accounting method, CBO projects the bank to lose $2 million. I want you to discuss that um, uh, process because it, from my perspective, this is what a lot of my constituents say. There is government accounting, then there is real accounting. And this is something that I would like uh, an answer on. Uh, well, thank you, Congressman. You know, the government accounting system that was put in the uh, FICRA, the Federal Credit Reform Act in 1990, went into effect in 1992, that is the accounting system that the U.S. government runs on. We can, you know, I ran a company for 20 years. You can't pick and choose your accounting system. That is the accounting system that the government uses. Fair value accounting is an alternate uh, approach to accounting. It is, not, it is not force of law. It is not what Congress has passed. Uh, so we abide by the accounting system that is in place. The swing you mentioned from if you look, change accounting systems assumes one other gross statement, and that is that nothing else changes. Well, things could change. We, we could change our fee structure. We could change the way we operate so to make sure that we are still self-sustaining. It so, assumed nothing changes. Okay, and, I, and I appreciate it, but my, my, I guess my, my question here is, Okay, you go from fourteen under, billion under. Yes, we're going to be dead, but the two billion loss, which is real. Well, under current, are you going? I mean, but un, under a current accounting systems, um, fourteen billion dollars by by uh, GAO by um, uh, yes GAO is CBO is the correct number. But the fact of the matter is, Congressman, in October of this year, unmistakably, we sent. To Treasury, one billion fifty-seven million dollars. Over the last two years, we have sent to Treasury cash of two billion dollars. That's unmistakable. Whether you change the accounting system or not, the cash is still there. Okay. Following up on some other issues, Mr. Hopper, the Wall Street Journal article, 2010, the bank changed how it disclosed financial or financing deals and no longer discloses all the small business loans it originates. Um, this is something that's, that, w that seems to be a thread today on a lot of other issues, not just this hearing, but others, that transparency and, and accountability are things that the people are clamoring for. We see this in, in scandals all over the place. My question is, what is your rationale for reducing transparency and disclosure in this area? Well, uh, Congressman, I will also refer you to this competitiveness report that we issue. Uh, we are cited as being, by our competitors, of being the most com transparent export credit agency in the entire world. And frankly, the, the biggest readers of this document each week, each year, is not just members of Congress, it is the 59 other export credit agencies, because we have greater transparency on our loans through the Federal Register, our environmental record, and so forth. That is that, that is wonderful. But why, then if that, that, that be true, that is great. It is a nice little book. But why not disclose all of them? Why did we change the method? Why did we not uh, disclose them? Disclose all the small business loan that originates. I am unfamiliar this with This is the 2010 Wall Street Journal article. Well, that discuss this. 
I would be happy to get back to that. I am not familiar with the precise Okay, and if you would, then then I'll submit that you know, the questions into the record. I'd like a, a written response on, I'd be on happy that. To do because that. Uh, again, it, it's you can bring in the committee, and I think this is the part we're getting to. This these questions that come up, and, and I would like you, I would point to something that says we're doing it fine. But the reality is, there's articles that that say that we're not doing it. So as as we look at it, um, you know, these are things that we need. Also, July 2010, the Bank's Board of Directors issued a resolution on individual delegated authority, authorizing certain individuals and XM bank officers to approve loans, guarantees, and insurance up to $10 million. What steps have you taken to address the Inspector General's criticism that individual delegated authority allows for application of insufficient, inconsistent criteria and may insufficiently mitigate the risk of default or fraud? In an, in an effort to uh, both streamline the bank and also provide um, accountability, we have uh, senior officers can approve up to $10 million. We have an audit of that on a regular basis that we ensure that those who have individual delegated authority are complying with the full credit standards of the bank. We have uniform credit standards across the bank. We are working to increase the harmonization between programs. But um, we actually have a harmonized credit standard of the bank. We have a a division of the bank, a senior vice president, who looks purely at credit policy to make sure that we apply it uniformly across every area of the bank. We find the same credit standards for countries, regardless of what area of the bank it is in. So uh, I would say that that is not correct. So you would disagree with the Inspector General? Today, I don't know. After, the after inputting the steps that you have just taken? I do, yes. In okay. other words, each time the Inspector General has made some suggestions, we have work to either incorporate them already or working to incorporate them. Oh, real quickly, and I know, Chairman, my time, but just, just, well, just one second. Going back to this other question where you will say you will get back to me on no longer disclosing, uh, one of the also things the Office Inspector General said there are 40 outstanding investigations involving fraud against the bank. I just have a question because we are not disclosing small business loans. Do most of these cases involve small business loans? Generally speaking, yes. I, can't, I can give you a better precise answer, but generally speaking, yes. They so do. the ones we are not disclosing are the ones that right now we are investigating for fraud against the bank, for the most part? No, I don't think that is the case, sir. I am sorry. Your question is, we disclose last year, give me an example, we did 3,413 small business loans. Wait, wait, Each wait, one wait, of wait, them wait. is. Let us go back. That is not my question. You're, then you're, I'm, you're good I'm, not answering. Sure, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, then, then let's go back. According to the Office of Inspector General, there are 40 outstanding investigations involving fraud against the bank. Okay. Now, will you agree with that statement or disagree with that statement? I, I accept what the Inspector General says. Okay. Do most of these cases involve small business loans? This is not, I don't want to know 3,000 investigations. I want to know about these 40, and do they involve mainly small I, business I'll, loans? I, I don't want to mislead you. Let me get you a precise answer after I get your question in writing, and I will look it up. Okay. So you don't know? I do not know precisely. Okay. And these are outstanding investigations and you don't know? I don't know the okay. nature of every single outstanding investigation. Okay. Um, again, I think there's a lot of issues here. There's a lot of concern on the Hill uh, concerning uh, these actions, the things that we see. Transparency is needed, transparency and, and these questions. And again, I think as we said before, looking at these ideas and, the, and having these transparencies, no matter what others may say, is coming down and saying, okay, what is the truth and what we are seeing between the, the, the truth and reality? These have got to be answered. And I know the people in the Ninth District want to know this, and this is uh, important for this committee to continue to look at because this affects a lot of businesses, it affects a lot of, uh, of uh, priorities in this country, and frankly, it is not something that the government needs to be dabbling in, especially if there are other ways to do it. So, Mr. Chairman, I do yield back. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Hochberg, uh, real quickly before yielding to Mr. Uh, or, or recognizing Mr. Conley. Uh, do you know if the uh, bribery allegations against Mr. Gutierrez and the three others, uh, have, have, has there been any referral to the FBI and the Justice Department? Do you know? Uh, to my knowledge, the Inspector General is working with the Justice Department on these. So the Justice Department is involved today. As uh, uh, Your understanding, the Justice Department is involved in this investigation? That is correct. And including the FBI? I don't know that. Have you had any convers Have you personally had any conversation with the Justice Department, the FBI, regarding the investigation into uh, Mr. the bribery allegations against Mr. Gutierrez and the three others? I have not. <clears throat> no, I do not. Okay. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome, Mr. Hochberg, to uh, to our committee. I'm sure it's a special moment for you. Um, Mr. Hochberg, what did you do before you became the head of the Exim Bank? I, excuse me, I spent 20 years in business, a 
family business, small business for 20 years. Um, then I actually also, after that, I served in the Clinton administration, and I was also a dean of a school of management and urban policy in New York. And uh, with that private sector background, what made you decide you wanted to head up the Exim Bank in this administration? You know, I, 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 my family, my mother actually came here from Germany and started a business, and uh, I, was, I grew up in that. I grew up at the kitchen table hearing about it. I enjoyed going, going to work together. I got my master's degree. I was first college graduate to go work at the company. Uh, worked for 20 years building a business called Lily and Vernon. Uh, catalog company that became a public company. I took it public um, and spent 20 spectacular years there. And I like public service. I, I like public service. Um, perhaps it is coming from immigrant parents where you think about trying to make this country a better country. And so this was a way I could uh, participate in that, both at the Small Business Administration as a dean of a graduate school and then here at the Export Input Bank. Well, I hope you understand that there are a number of us who very much appreciate that and are pleased uh, you are where you are and that you have made that kind of decision about public service. Thank you, because of your you. service to your country. Um, your testimony explained that on advice of the general counsel and the bank's IG, who is leading the ongoing investigations, you will not disclose the details or information about the individuals involved in the alleged incidents of fraud or corruption. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you think it is fair? that because there are alleged incidents of such fraud or cor corruption, um, that the entire work of the Exim Bank should be discredited, and indeed we should allow the, uh, uh, the expiration of the authorization of the Exim Bank to exist at all? No. Why? We have four individuals who are, one, of an alleged wrongdoing. We don't know that they have committed a wrongdoing. We, they have not be, even been indicted. They have not been gone to, gone to court. So I think that we, that is, you know, those are four isolated cases. Uh, we have not had any in, I have been at the bank since 2009. It is the first time, not, nothing in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and just came in at the end of 13 in this year. So right. We have had a number of years that have been no allegations whatsoever and no indictments. Because I think some who are maybe uh, committed to an ideological agenda to uh, allowing the Exim Bank to expire um, want the public to have an impression that somehow it is rampant with corruption and fraud. These are isolated, isolated incidents. Were any of them referred by you or your management actually to the IG? They were referred to by other employees. At the okay. Bank. So the system worked. The system worked. People looked and said there is something wrong with this transaction or that something doesn't seem appropriate here, and they brought it to the attention of the ethics officer and or the IG. And certainly if you look at it in a context of a five or six year period, obviously it does not characterize in any way the operation of the Exim Bank. I would agree with that. Unfortunately, human nature being what it is, sooner or later uh, there is always a bad apple that can appear. And the question is, how do we deal with it? And would you, how would you characterize the response of the agency when brought to your attention? Uh, I am proud of the agency and our ethics department, which acted immediately. The, uh, the employees, as evidence came through, were either put on administrative leave, and then ultimately three of them, as I said, have been separated from the bank. Why do you think, okay, thank you. Why do you think we need an Exim Bank? We need an Exim Bank because, first of all, we have been around for 80 years. It is the same reason we started with. We need to create more jobs in this country. This is about, and one of the source of jobs is going to be exports. One of the impediments to exporting is both risk and perceived risk, as well as foreign competition. So we exist when the private sector can step up to fill in the gap. That is one reason during the financial crisis, we between, almost between two and three times the volume of loans because there was a great need. As banks have entered the market again, our volumes are once again trimming back because our need is not as great. But my counterpart in Britain says just because you have not had a fire in five years does not mean you sell the fire truck. Focus just a little bit on the foreign competition. So do our foreign competitors have some, an analog to the Exim Bank? There are at least 59 other export credit. I'm sorry, how many? There are, about, there are at least 59 other export credit agencies around the world, whose purpose, frankly, is even more, much more aggressive than anything we have in the United States. Who, for example, sticks out in your mind in that category? 
China is the largest, without question. China is very large. Uh, Brazil has a very active program, uh, frankly, but so does Japan, so does Korea, so does Germany. Uh, those are some of our most formidable competitors. When we look at, for example, the uh, airline industry or the aircraft industry, um, what is Boeing, for example, up against? Boeing is up against uh, Airbus, which is supported by the export credit agencies of Germany, Britain, and France. There are three export credit agencies that support the sale of Airbus planes. Uh, I was just in China. Uh, China is building a large commercial aircraft to compete with both Boeing and Airbus. Uh, Russia has an aircraft that also competes. So the it, competitive intensity around aircraft, which is our largest aerospace, our largest single export category, is intense and getting more intense. Um, would you say that even with the help of Exim Bank, it is not a level playing field in terms of what we are up against with Airbus? Oh, it frequently is not not in level playing field. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just end uh, by saying, um, you know, I understand, I guess from pure ideological point of view, those who argue, well, uh, chaitres parbus, all other things being equal, we shouldn't need this kind of instrument. Uh, the market should work. But your testimony about 59 export subsidies or, or entities that subsidize uh, our foreign competition tells us we are a long way away from a perfect world or, or a level playing field, and it would be naive and indeed self-destructive, it seems to me, for the United States not to reauthorize the Exim Bank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. The uh, gentleman from Florida is recognized. Uh, Mr. Hochberg, you stress the, um, your commitment to ethics, and I do think that that is sincere on your part, and I appreciate that. Do you believe, uh, just understanding hum human nature, that there is a greater risk of, of bribery and graft with XM just simply because there are lucrative deals that's at issue? Greater than what? Greater than, say, the Department of Education. I am not in a position to really evaluate degrees of, of enticement to take briberies from one agency to another. Okay. Very well. Um, in terms of the accounting, I know they are back and forth the way that the bank does the accounting. There is a, a windfall for the taxpayer. The way the CBO did it under fair value, it was a loss uh, of a couple billion over 10 years. Um, my question is just simply, you were in the private sector. Um, that is pretty standard convention to use the fair value accounting. Well, what is the reason that fair value accounting is not used at XM? The Federal Government, Congress has passed a law that we use FICRA, Federal Credit Reform Act, that guides government accounting. We don't pick and choose our accounting system. You as members of Congress vote to prove whatever the accounting system is, and we abide by that law. So you are so you're not opposed to fair value if Congress wants to go that way? I, I was under the Well, I haven't made that. an opinion. Of, I, I, okay. I haven't studied it to give you an opinion on that. I am simply telling you, I follow okay. the law. The law says we follow No, I understand that, but I thought that you, had, you had expressed some resistance to it. So you will not endorse using fair value accounting with the bank at this time? I, w I will endorse whatever the law says I should do. Do you believe that, because the, there is an issue about the bank supporting jobs, you, using the term support, I was back and forth, do you believe that uh, the bank actually creates jobs uh, net? In other words, if there wasn't the bank, we would have fewer jobs here in the U.S. economy? Without question. Let me, let me just talk about supporting jobs for a minute. I was recently in Chicago, a company called Howe Corporation. It makes refrigeration units that is used on fishing boats and so forth. Mary Howe, fourth generation is now exporting up to 40 percent a year. She said to me, because of you, it is in the Chicago Tribune, because of the Exim Bank, I did not have to lay off a single person. I kept my 40 people working. So in that case, we supported those jobs. We did not necessarily add jobs, but were we not there, Mary said very clearly, I would have had to lay people off. I did not want to lay people off. So you supported my being able to keep a full workforce. In other places, where it is, as uh, Congresswoman Duckworth said, there is a new sale. In, in Mary's case, we replace sales lost because of the financial crisis here. Where there is a new sale, it often means adding another shift and hiring employees. So it depends. We use the word support to be conservative as opposed to being No, aggressive. I understand that. And I, and I think you can point to a transaction you may have there where maybe those jobs um, would not have been there without a certain finance package. Uh, but as I read the reports, there are examples in which XM loans benefit foreign 
uh, competitors of our domestic manufacturers. For example, there was an energy refinery in Turkey, and there was concern raised here domestically from a um, Texas refinery manufacturers, basically saying, look, you are directing government power to do this deal, but then that has ended up disadvantaging us. And so when you are saying it creates more jobs, are you also accounting for maybe the back end of some of those transactions and how that could affect domestic competitors? Uh, Congress has uh, put in our charter and we follow it and we updated those regulations. It is referred to as economic impact. On every transaction we review, is the economic benefit to the U.S. economy outweigh any potential harm? So in the particular transaction you are referring to, we looked at what is the economic benefit to the U.S. economy by making these exports, what is the potential harm to the U.S. economy, and to ensure that there is a positive benefit to the U.S. economy. And then the independent board, which is made up, it is a bipartisan board, still votes on that transaction. There was back and forth about the number of dollars that go to small businesses. I think it was 19 percent last year, and I think you have said now it is up to 22 percent. We are stronger right now. So far this year. Um, as I understand it, the definition of small business, that includes firms with employees up to, what, 1,500? Well, the SBA makes those determinations of what actually is a small business. It's not our determination. But, we, is, but we, is that? But I know, I know I understand that. But is that the, when when this stuff is being put out, uh, it would include the firms up to fifteen hundred? Is that the number that's used? Generally, in manufacturing, the rough number is five hundred. But again, the SBA they determine. I was at the SBA. They look at every industry and say, but what's small by that industry's category? So category. no, I understand that. But I, I, I just. Trying to figure out it, the, the upper level of what would be considered small would be fifteen hundred. Is that I, I just read reports. I'm just seeing if that's. I haven't seen the number that high. Okay. Um, well, look, the five hundred. If um, if we can get that used for Obamacare, the initial thing that would give a lot of relief to a lot of small businesses in my district. So um, I'm not above uh, counting that as uh, as five hundred. One final question. Um, how does the bank view its role in terms of the national security component that could affect uh, economic transactions between certain uh, states? And some of these deals are with, with essentially state directed enterprises. It was reported today in an article by a columnist in the Washington Post that two of Hamas's supporters are Qatar and Turkey. Um, last fiscal year, the bank authorized $775 million to Qatar, $4.3 billion. Uh, for business in Turkey. Of course, Turkey's prime minister has come out and said that Israel is worse than Hitler, uh, and he has basically taken a very anti-Western, uh, pro-Islamist stance. So uh, how can we, just as people in Congress, when we are looking and we have duties with national security, um, how can we be sure that the deals that are being done are also consistent with our national security goals and strategies? There is something referred to as the National Advisory Committee, which uh, reviews all transactions over $30 million that the Board votes upon. Uh, so they are shared with the State Department, Treasury, Commerce, and other relevant agencies who render an opinion whether there is anything wrong with the entities that are part of the transaction. So in your case with Qatar or, or Turkey, as an example, they were all greenlighted by the various agencies that are part of the National Advisory Council. Well, no, and I, I appreciate that. And in fact, I think looking at some of the conflicts we see, I think our administration has been erring by siding with with Qatar and Turkey um, over some of the uh, stronger allies that we have in the region. But I appreciate the testimony, and I yield back. Gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Hochberg. I, I want to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Connolly of Virginia. I thank you not only for appearing here today. Uh, but I recognize uh, your uh, extensive credentials in, in the business world, uh, your capabilities. Uh, you have the ability to go out and make an exponential uh, uh, amount of money more than what the Federal Government is paying you for your public service, and I thank you for that. Uh, I also want to uh, uh, note that you came to the Exim Bank in 2009. 2009 isn't when the Exim Bank started. It started in 1934 uh, by executive order of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And, and for everyone's information, um, Congress did not sue President Roosevelt for that executive order as, an, uh, uh, as going beyond the bounds of the Constitution. In fact, President Ronald Reagan 
supported expanding it, as was noted uh, in the New York Times article uh, op-ed uh, published yesterday by uh, former uh, uh, President Reagan's uh, Sec Secretary of Labor, uh, William Brock III, who was also a, a Republican senator from Tennessee. Uh, his uh, his op-ed is called Don't Kill the Export-Import Bank, and he makes a particular point that President Reagan saw the value in the bank uh, in assisting American businesses to compete abroad and uh, supported expanding it. Um, I also want to note that uh, uh, the Export-Import Bank, in, in your testimony, Mr. Hochberg, has a default rate of 0 0.194 percent. Uh, which is less than one-fifth of one percent, and I certainly invite uh, Mr. Mulvaney, my colleague, uh, to uh, challenge that uh, if he thinks that that is incorrect. Uh, but uh, that's, an, uh, that's an, uh, a very small default rate uh, indeed. Uh, but I want to direct my, and we, we don't mean to ignore you, Ms. Katz, but you're here from the Heritage Foundation. Am I correct in that? That's correct. The, ex the opinions you express are not simply your own, they are also those of the Heritage Foundation, correct? Uh, no, that's not correct. They, they reflect my own. They are your own opinions, but not those of the Heritage Foundation? Correct. Okay. Uh, are you paid by the Heritage Foundation? Yes. Uh, do they know you are here today instead of at work? I consider this work. Okay. Um, Dealing with us is. Uh, Here is a question. Uh, is the Heritage Foundation in favor of abolishing the Export-Import Bank? I am in favor of abolishing the Export-Import Bank. Okay. Well, you, so you don't know if the F Heritage Foundation shares well, like, that opinion? The Heritage Foundation is made up of, you know, some, I don't know how many people, two, three hundred people, and there is a variety of opinion in Heritage about all sorts of things. Uh, but. I'm here to discuss my research and my opinions and not those of Heritage in general. All right. Can you tell us what percentage of the supporters of the Heritage Foundation are exporting companies? I have no idea. Can you tell us what percentage of the supporters of the Heritage Foundation are companies assisted by the XM Bank in exporting? No, because I really don't pay any attention to who uh, you know, who funds Heritage. I do know, though, that the largest proportion of, of funders are um, individuals. Can you and tell I, us what percentage of, of uh, Heritage Foundation supporters are big companies or people associated with big companies that don't like competition from small U.S. exporters assisted by the XM Bank? I have no idea. But I do know that, the, that 75 percent of the um, uh, the benefits of, of XM financing go to uh, about 10 very large corporations and only about half a percent of uh, small businesses in, in the U.S. receive uh, assistance from XM. Do you, uh, I want to jump to a point that uh, my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, was, was driving home, and he is a former Federal prosecutor. Do you have any information that U.S. attorneys are not good at prosecuting cases of fraud when they are perpetrated against the XM Bank? I have no information about that. Uh, are you saying that U.S. attorneys don't have the full range of prosecutorial tools available to them when well, handling cases of fraud perpetrated on the Export-Import Bank? Well, they certainly have had dozens of cases to prosecute, which they have. Uh, but you are not saying they, can't, they don't have the full range of tools, are you? I don't know what their, their arsenal is, sir. Do you have any information that the FBI doesn't have the full range of investigative tools uh, when handling cases of fraud perpetrated on the Export-Import Bank? I don't know what the FBI's resources are with respect to the Export-Import Bank, although I do know that um, you know, there have been a you know, considerable number of cases of fraud at the bank. So every time there is a case of fraud involving the Export-Import Bank, a case of fraud against, perpetrated against the import, Export-Import Bank, every time there is such a case, the U.S. government has at its disposal the full, rate of, uh, full range of investigative and prosecutorial tools that it can bring to bear on any prosecution 
that it brings in this nation. Am I correct in that? You're, I, I assume you are correct, but my preference from a policy standpoint would be to be able to prevent fraud cases rather than building up um, you know, ever larger um, resources for prosecutors to act after the fact. And what we do know is that XM um, is not uh, managed with uh, the intent of maximizing uh, protection against fraud. Well, I happen to agree with Mr. Meehan of Pennsylvania that to, to do away with fraud entirely, you have to change human nature, not abolish the Export-Import Bank. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I think the gentleman, no one is alleging that the Department of Justice can't do uh, a fraud investigation in the Export-Import Bank, although I have questioned the Department of Justice investigation into other issues that have been in front of this committee. Uh, and I think uh, you know, 26 Democrats agreed with every single Republican saying we needed a special prosecutor in that situation. So no one is alleging that here. What we are saying is there is nothing in the law that prevents Mr. Hochberg of telling us what he knows, and he won't do that. He won't tell us the three other individuals. He won't tell us anything about how Mr. Gutierrez's name became public. He won't tell us if, if they have even done an investigation. It sounds like they haven't. As to how that, I mean, if it is so important that we not jeopardize and, and, and disclose who these people are, you would have think, you would have thought that they would have done an internal investigation to figure out how Mr. Gutierrez's name became public. So that is all we are saying is why not, it, it, frankly, Mr. Hochberg, we have had this before. We have had witnesses sit here and tell us we can't give you information that you are asking for because there is an ongoing investigation. And then we do subpoenas and we get the information. In fact, the Inspector General told us, we asked him for certain documents relative to today's hearing, and he said, go ask Mr. Hochberg, get them from him. So obviously, by, when he tells us that, you could provide them. You just choose not to, not to provide them. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. I have just got some bits and pieces to fill in. Um, jobs, Mr. Hochberg, Mr. DeSantis, before he left, asked you a question about whether or not you count potential job losses when you provide your information to Congress about how many jobs you support. You don't, you don't count that, do you? For example, uh, Delta claims they lost 7,500 jobs uh, via the sale of uh, uh, the Export Import Bank support to a purchase of Boeing jets by Air India. You don't count those losses when you report those jobs to Congress, do you? First of all, Delta has never validated where they got those numbers from. I have no But I think you testified, I am not trying to bait you, but I, I think you testified in a previous hearing that I was in that you report a gross number. We report the gross numbers of jobs that are supported by Exim financing. Yeah. But in candor, Congressman Mulvaney, in my opinion, they actually understate the jobs. They do not overstate them. Fair enough. Uh, Mr. Carwright raised a good point about default rates, and I meant to talk about that before. The default rate of 0, 0.0, I think, uh, 0 0.195 is your default rate. Now, it, back as recently as the late 80s and early 90s, the default rate was 40 percent. You all changed the way you count defaults, don't, didn't you? Or Congress changed it for you? We calculate our default rates according to the way Congress has asked us to do so. I have the results in front of me for the last six years. Is it the same the way that private crisis. financial institutions report defaults? To my knowledge, it is the same. And in fact, I mentioned in my oral testimony that uh, our default, the commercial bank and industrial bank default rates is calculated by the Fed. The average is three to four times. No, I understand that, but you don't count defaults the same way as a commercial bank does. A default to them is not the same as a default to you. We it's not apples to apples, to Mr. Cartwright's point, though. No, we calculate defaults the way Congress has asked us to report the default right. rates to Congress. And I'm back in the 80s and 90s, when the definition was different, that was as high as 40 percent. You still have I debt. I don't know whether it was the same methodology. You still have debt on your books at the Export Import Bank from pre-Castro Cuba, don't you? Do you think you are going to collect that debt? We, I, I don't, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know the answer. If it were on there, do you think that I, it's you a would hypothetical be able to, question? Right, but if it is it on there, then I get to ask you the question next time, right? Because it's on there. You all have debt uh, on the books from pre Castro Cuba. You have debt on the books from, um, uh, before, I think, 1970s China when Mao was there. Um, but anyway, the, my point of this to Mr. Cartwright is this, that do not take, I encourage my colleagues not to take it as an apples to apples comparison. The, the 0.195 percent is not the same, not calculated the same way as it is at, say, Bank of America uh, or PNC or something like that. The IG had two, two things to say, and I am just going to ask you if you agree or disagree with these uh, statements. The IG gave testimony to the financial services um, uh, about four or five weeks ago. 
And um, uh, Mr. Grotico said um, that the bank management has consistently failed to establish internal controls over business operations and noted that there were, quote, clear guidance to staff and establishing clear roles and authorities have not been prevalent at the XM Bank, end quote. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? I disagree. And then he went on to say that, uh, and I am reading now from Ms. Katz's uh, testimony until I get to the quotations, that um, uh, such operational shortcomings worsened at the bank, uh, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. And then as noted by the Inspector General, quote, this rapid growth in XM Bank's total portfolio exposure raises concerns as to XM's ability to manage and monitor this significant portfolio growth, close quote. Do you agree or disagree with that? I disagree with that. Fair enough. Um, and then lastly, um, Mr. Cartwright, or I think it may have been uh, Mr. Connolly mentioned Ronald Reagan. My experience in my brief period here is that I don't use Ronald Reagan quotations. I sort of treat them like Bible quotations, uh, in that you can usually find something to take either side of a particular story. Uh, but in order to rehabilitate um, the, 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 my favorite president during my lifetime. In 1981, he uh, suggested the bank needed to re be reduced by at least a third. And in 1985, he asked, quote, is it fair to ask taxpayers to help pay billions for export subsidies to a handful of America's biggest corporations? We will also save billions by eliminating taxpayers' subsidies to some of America's biggest corporations through export-import bank loans, close quote. Um, so it seems to me that uh, the debate has been going on for a long time. The issues are still here. I just was hoping that maybe this might be the year we could fix some of them. With that, I will yield back. Thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for his participation today. Uh, let me just go where Mr. Mulvaney was, uh, Mr. Hochberg. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, normally you, you try to ask questions you know the answer to here, but, but I don't know this one. The, uh, he was, Mr. Mulvaney was talking about the delta and the, and the gross number of jobs that you report. Um, the, the example you gave of the lady in Chicago, I think it is in the refrigeration business and she has 40 employees, is that when you, when you um, report to Congress jobs that XM Bank financing supports, would those 40 jobs be in that number? Only the jobs, that, only what would be allocated to the financings we have done. Oh, we don't finance 100 percent of our business, so I would not count 40 jobs. But, so, but you would count some of them? We count those that are allocated to exporting. And how do you determine that? We use the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We look at the dollar volume, and they have tables we are able to access that says, looking at the full supply chain of different categories of industrial products, we are able to calculate how many jobs are created in the supply chain. And in that example, them. do you know how many were the supported jobs that, that she talked about? Uh, how many were, were used in your calculation that you gave Congress? Well, was it three? Was it seven? Was it? 39. Mary said to me she has got about 40 employees, and depending on the year, 20 to 40 percent of her sales were exports. So it depends. So you took 30 percent of that number and no, you no, gave no. It I would, we, each year we would report based on what actually we did. We don't take averages. We say, what do we actually do working? If we, we did zero that year, we count zero. Okay. Okay. Just I, I didn't know, I didn't know how, how you do it, uh, Ms. Katz. Th there's a, are you familiar with this the the loan uh, the Exxon Mobil liquid natural nat, uh, natural gas the New Guinea the Papua, in Papua New, New Guinea, Guinea yeah yes a bit all right and and it's been reported that the Inspector General released a report detailing comprehensive inspection of this transaction and he specifically said the uh, fault of the bank for taking insufficient steps to protect the bank from fraud but we've talked about it a lot today. And for quote being unable to properly account for 500 million in local costs, you remember that? Yes. And so, is it accurate to say we don't know what happened to 500 million dollars? Well, they were they were claimed to be local um, expenses, but they don't have any receipts. Any any details about those local expenses? So we have no verify, idea. They can't verify them. And Mr. Hochberg, I assume that's a concern to you and the folks at the bank. Well, I just disagree with the assertion. All right. So let me just let's discuss what this project is. If I can, can I take one minute for, for Congressman Mulvaney? When we have a debt to Cuba, it is written to zero. We don't throw it away because we 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 may write it down. To, it has zero value on our books. It's been totally written off. On the other hand, we don't take debts like that and remove them from our books because as the case with Argentina and other countries, at some point that we expect to be repaid. Do you but count in terms that as of the default? value, it's zero. Do you count it as a default? It's already been written off. Yes, it's been the default number. It's so that the, counts as yeah. a default. Yeah, it's in the default number. Thank you very much. All right. Back to your question, Mr. Chairman. On um, the project is Papua New Guinea. This was a project, a large LNG project in Papua New Guinea. Uh, the U.S. Export Import Bank provided um, 
$3 billion so that more jobs would be supported here in the United States. Part of our support when we do a project of that nature, as you can understand, some costs are incurred locally. They are not all. So as standard practice with the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation Development, we can do up to 30 percent of local cost to make sure that that sale gets done. About $576 million was incurred in local cost. ExxonMobil is the project sponsor. They have certified under criminal penalty that those costs were true and incurred and validated. And the Inspector General has said, quote, unquote, that that transaction was properly structured and documented and complied with all laws of know your customer, and they had no evidence whatsoever of any improper local costs being submitted. So that is, I, I would disagree with Ms. Katz. All right. Um, on the, um, were the three other individuals identified in the Wall Street Journal article who, um, for alleged fraud and, and potential bribes, um, were there, are they being investigated in relation to the same matter that Mr. Gutierrez is being investigated for? Is it all related to Impex, or are the other three on some different issue or transaction? There are four individuals, and there are three separate cases. So, and, and you, uh, I assume you are going to, when I ask you what those other cases involving what companies, you are going to say, uh, I can't tell you. The Inspector General is, is working through these cases. They really, they would like the opportunity and not to have anything more compromised than they believe has already been compromised by but, the But Mr. I keep Gutierrez coming back to this, Mr. Hochberg. There is nothing in the law that prevents you from under oath in front of a congressional committee doing a legitimate congressional investigation at an appropriate time when we are looking at the Exim Bank reauthorization legislation. There is nothing in the law that prevents you from disclosing these information are, we ask about. These are alleged, and they are under And we understand alleged means alleged, and you can, you can, that, that you are innocent until proven guilty. In fact, you can invoke any privilege and right you have, like we just saw a few hours ago from Mr. Gutierrez, where he invoked his Fifth Amendment privilege. We understand all that. But we are asking you, the guy, the head of the bank, who just told us that there are four individuals under investigation for alleged bribes and corruption on three different issues, dealing with three different loans a bank has made to different companies, different organizations, and you are only going to tell us about, we only know about Impex, we are asking about the other two. Can you tell us the companies involved in the other two? The, first of all, you have made a couple of assertions that they deal with loans and, and other individuals. I, all I can say is there are four individuals, three are no longer working at the bank, one is on administrative leave. And the Inspector General, Department of Justice, is investigating this for possible criminal case. And you said you had you've had no interaction with the Department of Justice. So is it accurate to say the Department of Justice has not instructed you not to share information with Congress? The, the, this, these are in the yes or no. That's a yes or no. Did the Department of Justice instruct you not to share information? I have not with met with the Department of Justice. All right. And just again, for the record, and I did this earlier. The Inspector General has not specifically told you, Mr. Hochberg, do not talk to, do not disclose the three other individuals, do not disclose the three other companies or whatever is involved in these, in these three situations. Did he specifically tell you not to disclose that to us? The, our General Counsel made that recommendation on concurrence from the Inspector General. The inspector, uh, that's, I, I, I'm not asking the, that. The, I'm asking, did the Inspector General specifically I did not tell speak you? Directly. Because what we get from the Inspector General, when we ask for certain documents, he said, go talk to Mr. Hochberg, see if you can get the documents from him. So that would imply that you can give them to us, which is what the law allows you to do if you, if you so choose. But you are choosing not to answer our questions and give us that information. I am choosing not to interfere with a criminal investigation. Okay. Do you have additional questions? Gentleman from South Carolina, we want to thank you, Mr. Hochberg, Ms. Katz, for, for being here today for an important hearing. And uh, committee is adjourned.